Welcome Tourism Cares, Innovation Norway and USTOA. My name is Terry Dale. I'm the president and CEO of USTOA. Thank you for joining us. First and foremost, let me get off my chest why I'm wearing a hat. <laughs> I had an appointment with my dermatologist a few days ago and my forehead looks like a pepperoni pizza. So I'm sparing you uh, from that visual. So first of all, Thank you for joining us as we prepare for uh, Trumoso, Norway. And I'm gonna do my best to try and get the title of this event correct. So I'm gonna try. Tourism Cares with Norway Meaningful Travel Summit in partnership with Innovation Norway and USTOA's Sustainability as Responsibility 2.0. I think that may be close to what we're creating here. And I wanted to take a minute to talk about how we got to this point. So as many of you know, a year ago in Buda, Norway, we hosted our first Sustainability as Responsibility Summit and to much success. So out of that event came a lot of interest from those attending as well as our broader membership to participate again next year. If we were to do it, uh, just through USTOA, we would have to do it in this window, spring of 23. And I knew that Tourism Cares was working on a meaningful travel summit also in Norway. So I went to Greg Takahara and said, should we consider, since both of our memberships overlap significantly, shouldn't we consider coexisting these two events and create a pilot program uh, and he said, yes. And I think it was the right thing to do because from a membership perspective, to have two events, three, four weeks apart from each other with basically the same members being invited, uh, it wasn't being sensitive to your time and your budgets and uh, staff resources are also always a challenge. So here we are today, we're very excited. Uh, I'm excited that 85% of the attendees going to Trumoso are USTOA members. We have 11 attendees who were with us last year in Buda, Norway. So welcome to those 11. And we are doing this. Last year in Buda, what we successfully accomplished was creating the urgency around why. Why this is critical to start the journey or complete the journey, depending on where you are in the process. Now with Tourism Cares leadership and knowledge, we go from the why to the how, and that will make this experience uh, unique to what we did in Buddha. So just two other things before I turn it over to Paula, I just want to uh, remind you that we have a new global social impact manager, Molly Lakab, Lakab, sorry, and she will be with us uh, in Trumoso. Please introduce yourself if you haven't had a chance to meet her. She's already doing great things in just two months with USTOA. So welcome, Molly. And then finally, as you know, last year for our 50th anniversary, we started the Future Lights campaign where we recognize and honor those leaders in our industry who are doing significant work around sustainability or DEI. We encourage you to submit nominations. Uh, the deadline is May 5th. So please, please, please take a look within your organization. It's a really important way to draw attention to leaders uh, that we want to emulate and learn from. So with that, we are very excited. Um, I won't be sporting a baseball cap in Trumoso and I look forward to seeing you there. And now I'll turn it over to Chief Impact Officer at Tourism Cares and our partner, Paula Brahmins. Paula? Thank you, Terry. Make sure I'm off mute. Um, hello, everyone. And thanks so much for joining this conversation ahead of Norway. And thank you as well for taking the time to travel all the way up to the Arctic Circle. It's one of the most fragile ecosystems on Earth right now. So a very appropriate place for us to have this gathering. And um, as Terry said, Sir Point 1.0 helped us establish the why within travel companies. And Tourism Cares with Norway 2.0, Sir 2.0 will help us establish the how within our companies and within the destinations and communities and ecosystems that we sell around the world. But how do we transition from that growth for growth sake mindset to a more sustainable and more long-term viable mindset? 
You know, we know that sustainable businesses require community outreach and engagement, you know, building relationships and finding and sourcing those sustainable and ethical and meaningful experiences. And we really see these gatherings, this program that you're coming to Norway for as a, an opportunity to, to create those collaboration techniques and those business shifting insights that come from peer-to-peer -peer dialogues that you're going to have on the ground and these shared experiences that we're gonna have together. Um, so Tourism Cares' is Meaningful Travel Summits really create those connections on how to be more hands-on in developing tourism's value chain. And we're headed back to Norway to really ground these ideas and principles that were laid out in last year's SIR. Um, so we're really excited to have this opportunity today to connect with you all on these principles before we head to Norway. I do want to say a quick thanks to our partners uh, and our sponsors, uh, Innovation Norway, of course, and USTOA. And the sponsors who are making this program happen with us are Herta Gruten, the Bob Whitley Memorial Fund, Tripmate, We Travel, Panama Tourism Authority, American Society of Travel Advisors, ASTA, Mashare, NTA, and CIDA. And now a word from our amazing hosts in Innovation Norway. I'm gonna turn it over to Hege Barnes. Thank you, Paula. Um, and thank you, Terry. And uh, hello, everyone. I am so excited to be here and I'm so excited to welcome you to Norway. Uh, and some of you back to Norway again, those that joined us last year in Buda. And this year we will actually venture even further north to my hometown of Tromsø, which is at 68 degrees north. And we will then even venture further north to the magical island of Svalbard, which is at 78 degrees north. And as you will see when you get there, these are scenically beautiful areas. They're gorgeous and they're increasingly popular among tourists. However, they're also very pristine and vulnerable, vulnerable areas that is heavily affected by climate change. So we have to do something. We have to do something to protect it and preserve it for future generations. And the question is what? What can we do to have the tourism industry care, be involved and be mindful of our own operations? It's a great first step. It's a, it's a valuable collective movement. So this also applies to the indigenous people of Norway, the Samis that you will also meet. And we will also learn how to respect, interact and learn from them. And from a Norwegian perspective, we aim to share uh, insight and knowledge for how we work with uh, sustainability and how we involve local communities of um, all stakeholders. We will hear from local companies, government officials, researchers, and academia on how they see and address climate change and the future of indigenous tourism. So I hope you're all ready to learn, interact, share ideas and concerns, and help us all move forward to a more sustainable and caring global tourism industry. But I'm so happy to welcome you all back to Norway and to Norway for those first timers that have never been. But this is in the Norwegian Arctic, we can really create something valuable together. So, so excited to have you there and to see you soon. So thank you all and back to you, Paula. I think we'd like to introduce Graham, who will be our facilitator, facilitator for this afternoon. Great, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you to everybody for, uh, for all those introductions. Uh, my name is Graham Miller. Uh, I'm going to be the, the facilitator for the week uh, that we have together uh, in Norway. Um, I'm uh, really grateful to, to Terry and to Paula and to Hegger for, for the opportunity to come out to Northern Norway. It's been a huge uh, ambition for a long uh, period of time to visit that part of the world. So I'm, uh, I'm really grateful of the, the chance to do that. Uh, we've got a fantastic program that we've put together for everybody. There's a lot of work has gone into uh, developing this schedule and um, a lot of calls and uh, trying to get uh, uh, just a call arranged when everybody's been in all different parts of the world has been uh, has been quite complex sometimes. But a lot of work has gone in um, to putting um, uh, okay. Uh, a, a lot of work has gone into putting the schedule together. And as Heger said, uh, a real range of speakers. Um, coming. So I think it's going to be a, a fantastic week. I've got about 40, 45 minutes to essentially run through everything that was covered uh, last year in uh, in four days. 
uh, at the summit in uh, in Norway. So what I'm going to do is try to sort of race through the, the key points of what was covered last uh, year. If there are any questions, if, if people are not understanding something that I'm saying, or if the, I don't know if the sound disappears or you can't understand my my perfect British accent, uh, then just put something in the in the Q&A or the chat. Um, otherwise, we'll I'll leave time at the end uh, for questions uh, and we'll uh, we can pick up stuff there. Um, the only other thing I've got is um, we're going to be circulating a questionnaire. Um, Katie's going to be sending a questionnaire around. It'll take about five minutes to complete maximum, but it really helped me to understand where everybody is in their sustainability journey. And as Terry mentioned, that sort of from why to how, um, helpful to know where, where everybody is. And there's going to be a little bit of reading uh, come as well, and that will come uh, on Monday. So let me share my screen and we can get started. Does that, um, can you see that on screen? I can't see anybody now, but I'm assuming that um, somebody will shout if um, if you can't see that. So hopefully you can see that. So that's me with uh, with basics of contact details and feel free to um, to email me with uh, with any questions. So what are we going to do? How do we move this forward? Is that not working? No, that's not going to work. How do we move the slide forward? <laughs> there we go, down at the bottom. There we go. Okay, so we're going to do four days learning in now 40 minutes. Um, as Terry said, there's a number of people on the call who were there last year uh, in Norway. Um, and I recognize some of this material might be familiar to some people, again, depending on where you are in your sustainability journey. Um, I always uh, like to think of it as, uh, you know, imagine you're going to see uh, the Rolling Stones, uh, which makes me Mick Jagger in this scenario, but imagine you're going to see the Rolling Stones. Nobody gets upset when they play the tunes that you know, uh, and you just take it for what it is and you enjoy it and you sing along to uh, Can't Get No Satisfaction. So think of this lecture like that, that if there's something you've covered from last year, if there's something that you know, just feel free to, um, to join in and, uh, and, and sing along. So we're going to cover something about what is sustainability, a shareholder, stakeholder view of sustainability. Um, a lot of last year was focused on the why. So we're going to look quickly at the business case for sustainability and then trying crucially to align what your strategy is with the sustainable development goals. Um, think about the need for measurement and some thoughts uh, on uh, how we measure sustainability. Uh, and then one of the questions that was a recurring question to last year was this, uh, was would they want you back as a question? So I'm going to sort of uh, leave with that and, uh, and maybe uh, a few thoughts around that as well. So what is the sustainability challenge? We, if, if we were meeting in person, we could uh, we could spend half an hour working through this. Uh, and it's, sometimes it's a fun little exercise to play and, and, and ask what is really important to people. So there's all these kind of surveys and the World Economic Forum does them and the UN does them and individual governments will do these. What are um, the most important issues um, facing this place, uh, this time? Uh, you as an individual, you can pick your sort of boundary to that question if you like. But if, if I ask that question, I would probably have almost as many different answers come back as I ask the question to. And we might run through um, poverty, we might run through uh, equity, uh, whether that's gender, whether that's sexuality, whether that's age, so interdiscipline, uh, intergenerational. We might look at the role of technology and AI, of course, you know, terrifying prospects uh, at the moment. Cost of living would be pretty high on, on people's agenda in some parts of the world. Uh, other parts of the world, it would be peace, uh, would be, uh, I guess, close to the top, or if not the top, uh, population growth, population lack of growth uh, in other parts of the world. Um, health uh, would would certainly be, uh, I would think, a top few. So what it, when we ask that question, it, the answer we get very much depends on, on who we're asking 
that question too. I'm going to choose to focus for a second on uh, carbon uh, and the climate challenge as one that's particularly relevant to tourism. Um, but I absolutely accept and, and I'm not closing off that all those other challenges are important. And um, on a different day at a different time, I could probably be persuaded that some of those other challenges were, were more important. And um, we're just gonna focus on carbon uh, for the moment as, as one example. Um, so this, uh, perhaps you'll have seen before, this is the famous uh, Keeling curve, Charles Keeling, uh, who was, a, was an academic at um, University of California in San Diego. Um, Keeling developed this curve in uh, 1958. And what you see, it's the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere um, every year. Keeling was an extraordinary scientist uh, and every year measured um, the carbon concentration um, in the atmosphere right through to his death in uh, 2005. Uh, and then in 2005, his son took on the challenge, Ralph Keeling, and has continued to measure um, this. So it's the longest continuous set of carbon um, concentration data that we have in the world. Um, Charles Keeling was a man very much after my own heart, started measuring it in um, Big Sur in uh, Monterey, uh, decided he could get a better set of readings up at the Olympic Mountains in uh, Washington State, um, and then took himself off to Hawaii to measure it. So he, I suspect he was a tourist at heart, actually, was, uh, was Charles Keeling. Um, uh, and so he measured this. So this is uh, since 1958. You can extrapolate that back um, over the last uh, 250 years, and you see what the Keeling curve with the different axis actually looks like um, in context of, of history. And then if you do that uh, over the last um, 2000 years, over the last two millennia, uh, then you can see what it looks like um, through to today. So that's just to put our, um, our carbon emissions uh, of the last 200 years or the last 50 years, the Keeling curve, uh, in context of, of history. If you look where those CO2 emissions uh, are coming from, these are, all, these are from the, the global, global Carbon Project. Um, we get a, a percentage of these um, come from land use change. So this is um, deforestation. Um, this is a removal of peatlands. This is the destruction of, of mangroves. It's those kind of, um, of activities. Uh, and then this comes from fossil fuels um, and industry. And then more specifically, you can see the impact of the top 90 carbon producers as a percentage of all fossil fuels presented, uh, 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 emitted. So it's something like about 60, the top 100 produce about 65% of global carbon emissions come from just 100 uh, organizations. Um, and I'm a big fan of transparency, so we should name them. Um, hopefully nobody's worried that they're on the list. Uh, <laughs> um, some of these, you can see the, the state owned um, uh, companies and you can see private sector companies. So um, this was, I think, 2018. Um, these uh, set of data came from. Um, uh, so Chevron is the world's number one uh, emitter, private emitter. Uh, Exxon, uh, not to be outdone, a British company, BP, uh, Anglo Dutch, Shell, uh, and then we go down through. Um, but you'll see these are largely uh, or exclusively oiling, oil and mining uh, companies. And of course, whilst it's easy to blame Exxon and Chevron and uh, these kind of companies, BP and, and Shell, of course, they're providing the oil uh, and the petrol, the oil we heat our houses with, um, the gas, the plastics, the petrol uh, that we run our cars with. So um, this is at our behest. These companies uh, operate. This is, you know, they're not. Uh, I suspect not not polluting the planet for the fun of it. These are um, to provide us with the services and the way that we live our lives. Um, carbon uh, emissions do produce good graphics, um, and this is a this is a NASA uh, graphic. Um, what's interesting about it? So you, you know, people will be used to seeing. Uh, the key areas of pollution 
uh, in the world. They'll know where, where the carbon emissions uh, come from. Uh, you can see those fairly easily. The thing I like about this one is you, you not only see the air routes as well, um, which are sort of uh, diluted because, of course, they don't all follow exactly the same path uh, across the planet. But you see the shipping routes, which do tend to follow more of a furrow uh, and more of a, of a set path. So you see this incredible shipping route from, um, well, from Europe um, through down to Cape Town, um, through the Middle East, um, down to, towards um, uh, Australasia um, uh, and, and across. So you see these incredible shipping routes as well as um, the air routes. And one of the interesting things, of course, is that the shipping routes, I'll get the, the percentage wrong, but I think it's something like 40% of all the ships on the ocean are moving coal. Uh, so they're moving fossil fuels as well. So we're burning fossil fuels to move fossil fuels to get it to another part of the world where we will uh, consume it. So what is sustainability? Well, it, it, it's everything potentially, uh, and that's both a strength and a weakness. Uh, it makes it hard to nail down, but it's it's a nice all embracing com, uh, concept. So it's a little motherhood and apple pie. Um, we could go through each of these SDGs like I've just done for carbon and sort of really, really depress ourselves. But I think that's probably not, <laughs> not a very helpful um, thing to do. Um, the SDGs, seven UN Sustainable Development Goals, I think are a good framework for thinking about sustainability. We need to understand, though, that not all of these things strike every destination uh, equally. So poverty is a problem in some parts of the world and not in others. Education, a problem in some parts of the world and not in others. I'm speaking from the UK. We tend not to have a water problem here. It rains all the time, um, but it is in Kenya uh, a problem. Um, food is a good example of that kind of localized uh, problem. We've got enough food in the planet to feed the planet, but we've got obesity um, as leading cause of death in some parts of the world. And we've got um, starvation and, uh, and malnutrition uh, in other parts of the world. So most of these problems tend to be quite localized. Carbon is not like that. Uh, weather's not generated um, from where it affects you. So the UK's weather doesn't start in the UK. Um, and a ton of carbon going into the atmosphere in the UK um, has the same impact as if it goes in Australia or if it goes in the US. So it's, it's like filling up the bathtub concept um, for carbon, whereas a lot of these other um, concepts um, uh, are very local. The SDGs, as I say, I, I think are, are, are quite a useful framework. The, the challenge that they present is there's, it's the, the, the trade-offs of these SDGs. So we live in, a, in an economy that's large or in a world that's largely coupled. Um, so trying to deal with no poverty uh, immediately runs us um, into the problem of um, air pollution. Um, or uh, pollution of, uh, of the waters um, because we have a coupled economy. So we generate um, wealth uh, and therefore remove poverty by um, economic production, which produces, um, by and large, which produces uh, emissions. So we have those, those tensions in here. And what the SDGs don't do is describe a single narrative of what the perfect world looks like that optimizes all of these uh, uh, competing goals, and, and they often are uh, competing goals. So we need to think about how do we reconcile them? How do we prioritize them? Um, so how do we have, uh, you know, is, is hunger more important than protecting life below water? Well, it kind of depends who you are, uh, what you are, if you're a fish or if you're a, or if you're a human. And we see that <clears throat> tension then come out through Tourism. This is um, uh, Santa Maria in uh, in Venice, um, which interestingly, you know, quarantine, uh, COVID fact. So quarantine, the concept of quarantine uh, originated here, which I only found out the other day. Quarantine is the original 40 days, if your Italian's good enough, 
Uh, and so ships coming in uh, were forced to berth here off on the on an island off of the, the, the mainland um, to ensure that they didn't bring disease um, onto the mainland uh, when they came. Um, but you see these kind of sites, and this is this is obviously a, a conflict of the tension between economic growth and community values. Uh, and so both of those would be um, under the, the SDG framework, but we see them sort of in conflict when we get places like this. And we see that increasingly now with, with Amsterdam, with Barcelona, where perhaps that balance is beginning to shift back to uh, a community focus at the expense of economic growth uh, and, and income. So everybody I'm sure will be familiar uh, unfortunately, with uh, with this kind of scenario, which of course is is much better now that the cruise ships are, are not allowed to berth there. Um, where was this? Uh, our neighbourhood is more important than your holidays. We try to live here. We see this kind of it's the disadvantage of being a tourism scholar. You kind of collect these uh, as you go around the world. Um, and then that was one of my favourite ones um, in uh, in Spain as well. So what does business think about sustainability, if that's sort of a broad assessment of what sustainability is? Um, the first Rio Earth Summit uh, back in 1992 um, didn't include business. It was government and civil society uh, only. This was seen as a government uh, and third sector uh, problem. Uh, I went to the Rio Plus 20 um, summit um, and businesses were allowed um, at that summit. And there was a lot of criticism that they were sort of seen to be taking over um, the, the, the discussions. I guess arguably today, the criticisms of the COP um, have been that, that business is, is perhaps too involved um, in these conversations and, and setting the agenda and, you know, and disrupting um, the documents that are produced uh, as a consequence. It feels to me pretty, um, uh, pretty pointless, really, uh, trying to think about sustainability without including business. Business is such a powerful force that if we don't include business as part of the solution, then we're going to miss this hugely powerful potential actor uh, in creating sustainability. So I think the, the view of, of business is really important uh, for sustainability. Um, Two, uh, two lovely looking gentlemen uh, on stage uh, on, on your screen. Uh, the gentleman with glasses is uh, Milton Friedman, uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, economist. Um, I don't have a Nobel Prize, uh, so uh, I'm a little uh, reluctant to criticize Friedman. Um, but Friedman's famous sort of contribution was that um, the social responsibility of business is to make profit. Um, that's that's all it should be about. It should be very sort of Adam Smith. It's about making uh, making money. Um, Friedman, though, sometimes gets misquoted or misrepresented. Uh, so he didn't uh, believe that you shouldn't promote social responsibility. His argument was that you should only do that where it's it's profitable to do so. He was very rational economist uh, and felt that if money was being invested into a company that wasn't optimizing the use of that, i.e. wasn't profit maximizing, um, then it was a waste of that money and that money would be better spent uh, in a more efficient resource, in a more efficient company uh, that, would, that, would, um, that would profit maximize. So Friedman absolutely wasn't against social responsibility. He was only against social responsibility where it wasn't the, the profit maximizing uh, thing to do. Uh, the other gentleman with the beard is, uh, is Edward Freeman, uh, unhelpfully similar names, Friedman and Friedman, Freeman, I did it there, Freeman. Um, Freeman uh, followed much more latterly uh, of the view that we really need to understand what a, a, a wider range of stakeholders view of the businesses, what goals do they have, and the role of business there should be to try to, and to include the views of those stakeholders in the way that the business manages itself and in sets its objectives. The challenge with, uh, with Freeman's view is how we reconcile all these views together. So um, there's a challenge with listening, with hearing those views, but then what we, what we do with those views and how we try to, uh, to consolidate those and to reconcile those is the challenge of the, uh, of the stakeholder view. 
it's become very popular. It's you know Larry Fink from from BlackRock promotes the stakeholder uh, view of of business. Um, the British Academy of Management, I was just reading the other day, now sees management that defines management and business as being about promoting this stakeholder view um, of society uh, and doing it profitably. So sort of flipping Friedman from being profitable, but maybe doing that through um, uh, through being socially responsible. This is about being socially responsible and making profit in, in the doing. So there's a, an important shift. Um, I don't think that, that Friedman and Freeman's views are uh, irreconcilable. I think you can see that there are companies uh, like Patagonia, clearly very profitable because of their social positioning. Um, I think there's, there's clearly companies at the other end like Chevron and, and Exxon where, you know, when they say things about social responsibility, we, we, we strongly suspect, I hope I'm not offending anybody, but we strongly suspect that they're, they're just doing it to, uh, to make money. Um, but I think there are, um, there are instances increasingly where we can make, we can have companies be socially responsible and that be the profit maximizing route to take. And hopefully that's, that's uh, what we will uncover um, during our week in Norway. And it's clearly what, what a lot of your uh, excellent businesses are doing. Um, at the moment. Perfect. Um, the business case for sustainability, um, you will have um, hopefully been through versions of this in your own organizations. Uh, so you can sort of choose an argument really, or sort of rotate between them. Cost savings uh, was probably one of the original reasons that was given for businesses to be um, sustainable. We use less resources, therefore it should be, uh, it should be cheaper. Um, I chair a company called uh, the Considerate Group. Uh, we set up remote monitors in uh, in hotels and resorts, so we get high frequency data. This is one day's worth of data um, from the um, electricity consumption of a, a five star hotel in London. We did a this is an example. We did a two month trial where we went around simply just turning off lights, turning off uh, equipment. We had the uh, the night guard go around and do that switched off the chandelier in reception between i think it was two o'clock and five o'clock in the morning um and then you get these kind of uh, energy savings so on a per month basis was the equivalent of four nights uh, four room nights um that we were saving um in in pounds this amount of carbon this amount of electricity no negative guest feedback uh, we did the same with boiler temperature turned it down by three degrees so if you've got your, when you have a shower, you mix in cold water with it, you've got your boiler too hot, you don't need to have it that hot. Um, again, we did a two month trial um, that saved the equivalent of 11 nights uh, uh, a month um, uh, in, uh, in cost, no negative guest feedback. And then the only one we did where we, um, uh, we needed a bit of capital outlay was to replace the shower heads um, and we re returned the um, the invested capital, uh, and actually, in interestingly, guest sentiment uh, improved uh, through that period because we told them what we were doing. So you can save um, save costs, <coughs> uh, generate positive image, recover a positive image. Patagonia have mentioned Unilever, good examples um, of that. You need to be careful of greenwashing or green hushing. Um, we see examples of that, of course. Um, I worked with a company, I'll probably keep it nameless, um, uh, a heli skiing company um, who thought they were doing fantastic things on sustainability and did a big all singing or dancing sustainability report. This is about 10 years ago they did that. Um, and as a consequence, generated a huge amount of storm of companies that didn't, and charities and environmental charities that just didn't know they existed before. And as soon as they sort of stuck their head above the parapet, claiming how good they were at sustainability, uh, everybody um, uh, did what you do when you see heads above the parapet and they shot at them. Um, and so we were sort of asked to, how do we uh, get our heads back down below the parapet again? Of course, it's, it's nearly impossible. And, I just looked, uh, they've just published their first sustainability report uh, since 2010 this year. So it's taken them um, you know, 10, 11, 12 years 
uh, to get back to the point where they feel, felt confident to make some comments about sustainability uh, again. So we do this with great hesitancy uh, and a good degree of humility, uh, I would say. Um, market opportunity, clearly that was again one of the original arguments, the Ben and Jerry's kind of body shop uh, original argument that we would appeal more to an upmarket elite consumer who would be willing to pay more uh, for the product. We see lots of stuff on uh, booking.com. I was looking at uh, just recently the surveys that show 80% of customers are interested in sustainability, 75% of customers willing to pay $20 extra per night for, for a sustainable company. I think we have to treat those with a huge degree of caution. Um, but clearly there are increasing market opportunities and market expectations now just from being a sustainable organization. Uh, it certainly helps with recruiting staff. Um, my students, I tell, I won't write them a reference for a company that's not a good company. Uh, they shouldn't waste their talents going to work for a company that doesn't have a strong sustainability um, policy. They simply don't deserve their talents and the investment they've made in their own uh, education. And I think that's increasingly filtering through not just a younger generation, but older generation uh, as well. We're going to be ahead of regulation. We see a lot of regulation coming in uh, sustainability um, in my position in, in Europe. We see a huge amount, um, whether it's um, taxes on the, the rise, um, EU coming up with laws against greenwashing and false advertising of environmental claims. Um, the Netherlands has just banned um, fossil fuel advertising and aviation advertising in Amsterdam. So you can't advertise an airline now in Amsterdam, really kind of positioning uh, aviation as one of the sort of sin stocks like we used to treat tobacco and alcohol uh, advertising. Uh, Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam has just now capped uh, the number of uh, flights uh, for environmental reasons, first airport uh, in the world to, um, to limit the number of flights for environmental reasons. So we see more regulation and clearly getting ahead of this is a way of um, uh, preventing future regulation. Uh, finance opportunities increasingly, whether that's ESG uh, reporting, whether it's the, the US um, Stock Exchange Commission on consultation at the moment on um, requiring companies to report on their, um, their climate risks uh, and their biodiversity risks uh, potentially as well. Um, so, so again, uh, opportunities for finance. Um, and one of the sort of holy grails, I guess, of sustainability is that we prove that sustainable companies are more profitable. Um, I've spent a long time looking at this. I would love to say that I could show that sustainable companies are more profitable. I just don't think you can. Um, what I think you can do and what the literature seems to be um, sort of consolidating around is that sustainable companies are lower risk companies. They're less volatile. They're less vulnerable to the vicissitudes of a market. That makes them more attractive uh, to investors. It's not such a roller coaster ride. Uh, and if you're a big financial investor, big institutional investor, you want your steady two to three percent return every year. You don't want ten percent up, ten percent down. That's that's a lot of stress if you've got a lot of money invested. So they tend to be lower risk. They tend to be better performing in that way. But I think there's something about the challenge of how do you measure sustainability and how do you measure financial performance that makes it difficult to correlate those two things together um, convincingly. The last point is about the moral argument. And um, that's perhaps not an argument that is often a very um, uh, trendy argument or one that gets made um, too uh, forcefully, um, particularly in a room full with uh, a room full of people with with industry, I even get groaned at from my students when I present about the moral case. But I do wonder whether um, there is, there is of course, the risk that we can't create a market for sustainability. And that doesn't stop the fact that this is still really important to do. Um, and it may be that we just have to progress with sustainability because it's the right thing to do, um, rather than because we can find a way to make money out of this, or we can find a find a market from it. So 
I, I, I put the, the moral argument up there. I'm not naive enough to, to think that, that that wins the day or that that gets you too far uh, in an organization or can take you too far on its own. But I also think it's not something that we should, uh, we should just dismiss uh, in pure favor of, uh, of the business case. So one of the ways I like to think about um, <clears throat> uh, some of these concepts is, is moving on from corporate social responsibility, which often seems a little bit tactical and a little bit tokenistic and, and runs the risk of, of, of greenwashing. It's, it is uh, Friedman's position about only doing if, it, if, it's, if it's profitable to do so or if it produces a return for us. I think the next step, and what was talked about a lot at last year's summit, um, is about aligning the company with the destination or the company with the place. And that I think you can think of as corporate social relevance. How do you make your company relevant to the society, to the place that you're going into? And then we'll extend that. And when we're in Norway, I'll talk about this uh, a little bit more about actually how do we try then through our companies and through our society working together, collaborating together, how do we regenerate the places where we're visiting? How do we regenerate our, our planet? So I think we can move on conceptually from CSR, quite cynical, quite greenwashing, quite tactical, through to corporate social relevance. How do we align the company with the destination, with the place where it operates? to then really thinking about how do we put back and how do we regenerate uh, a place. And so these are some of the models that, that allow us to do this. Um, this is one that, that, um, that was presented last year, the total impact measurement and management model. Um, and we, we, we identify all of the areas where we think we can have uh, an impact on all of the different stakeholders. Uh, we've got our financial performance at the middle, we could be very um, stakeholder driven, Freeman-esque, uh, and put financial performance as one of these um, five around the outside rather than the central activity, depending on your organization. So a B Corp would probably do that. Um, types of impact, and then boiling that down to the, the more specific uh, impacts we might have. Um, <clears throat> This is then a model that was sort of an extension or the usage rather of that model, um, which is TUI's model. They ran this with, uh, with the Travel Foundation in uh, Cyprus, uh, looking at all of the impact that they have. Um, this is, I, always, I think this is an interesting model. It helps us to, to structure our, our thinking, um, but it is, um, it's only our impact. It doesn't look at opportunity cost. Um, so it encourages us to think about spend. Uh, it doesn't necessarily encourage us to think about retained spend or how much benefit sticks to the economy. And that's how we run the risk sometimes of um, thinking uh, that high end tourists are the way to go rather than budget tourists. High end tourists have a lot of leakage out of the economy. Budget tourists tend not to. This kind of model would probably lead you to the conclusion that high end tourists are the way to go because it looks at income rather than retained income. You can take it further and look at how much uh, of our scarce resource does it take to earn that money. So we did some research on uh, Cyprus and looked at how much revenue was generated through different types of tourism per gallon of water because water is the scarce resource in Cyprus. And does that generate more revenue than farming, for example? Um, and would we want to give that water to tourism companies to fill up swimming pools rather than farmers to grow food? So it's again, it's a it's a it's an initial kind of uh, entry point into that. This is another one from Soniva, who I think do a really good job of this using the planetary boundaries uh, methodology. So, last couple of slides. Um, there's a need for measurement, for sure. Um, Antonio Guterres says, without evidence of where we stand, we can't confidently chart our path forward in realizing the sustainable development goals. I think that's absolutely right. Classic management mantra, what gets measured gets managed. There is the risk that what doesn't get measured doesn't get managed. Um, and can we measure everything? There's a lot of things that we can't 
measure and there's a risk then that we don't manage them because we can't measure them. Um, I think there's huge power in who does the measurement. Um, so I had a project in um, a place called Lake Baga in Bangladesh, um, which was a, a small tourism development. Um, and they wanted to do the measurement themselves. They wanted to create the indicators themselves. They wanted to collect the data themselves. They wanted to write the reports themselves. As their experience was when other people determine what's important, what should be measured, the things that are important to them don't get measured. And so they knew that there was power in holding the pen, uh, as they put it, uh, in order to make sure that their view of what is sustainability um, gets represented. I do sometimes worry that um, we spend perhaps too much time on the measurement uh, and we essentially we do know what to do and we just need to get on uh, and do it. Um, having more data is not often the answer um, to some of these values based decisions of what which of those priorities, uh, which is our priority, which of those development goals uh, is our priority. So I think sustainability is about contributing sustainable tourism is about contributing to sustainable development. Uh, it's about aligning the interests of the destination with those of the company. And a lot of last year was focused on that alignment of the interests of the destination with those of the company. It requires this very sort of local partnership, stakeholder driven approach. And a lot of um, the time that we're gonna have in Norway in a couple of weeks time is very much given to this creating of these partnerships and, and collaborative activities. <clears throat> the data do help us to manage a problem, um, but it's actually the process of collecting data that help us understand the interests and the needs of others and really sort of strengthen those relationships. So last question, would they want you back? Well, you could probably extend that and ask, well, how would you know if they wanted you back? And how would you know if you should go back? Uh, we need to um, be collecting some, some data. We need to have our strategy. We need to know what we're trying to operate, optimize. And then well, what collaborations uh, need to happen uh, for you to go back? And that's, I think, where we'll pick up uh, next in, in two weeks time or three weeks time uh, when we're in Norway is what are those collaborations and how do those collaborations happen for order, in order for us to feel confident that we're putting a good sustainable uh, product together that meets the needs of the destination, meets the needs of the business and meets the needs of all the stakeholders and reconciles those um, uh, sustainable development goals. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. How do I do for time? Not too bad. Um, and um, I'm happy to take any questions or um, uh, anything anybody wants to say or anything. And you can, um, if you have any questions for Graham, you can drop it in the Q&A box. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to be very quiet and very shy, uh, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but... Um, yeah, there was a, a, a lot of material covered uh, at last year's summit. So trying to um, uh, sort of shrink that down to uh, to 40 minutes uh, is a bit of a challenge, but I hope that I've done, um, done justice to what was covered uh, last year. Wonderful. Yeah, it's it's a lot to, to condense into a short period of time. Uh, so we've got a question then from Matt. Um, here's some ideas on how we can motivate consumers to make the changes that are needed? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, I, um, I started out my research about 200 years ago, thinking that if we, um, if we got consumers to be interested in sustainability, then that would provide the economic incentive for companies to change their behavior. Companies are 100% rational, they'll do whatever makes money. So if the consumers are asking for it, the companies will, um, <clears throat> will offer it, and then we will have sustainable tourism. And I spent 
probably a decade trying to uh, work out how we would do this and working with psychologists and um, how could we promote um, this sort of consumer sovereignty kind of argument. I'm slightly more cynical about that now. Um, and I think increasingly this has to come from companies uh, and it has to come from destinations and therefore it has to come from, from varying levels of government and, uh, and national government. Um, and that the consumer is plays a role and that for some kinds of products, they will provide the, um, the incentive for companies to change. But I think for the mass market, for the majority of consumers, um, it has to, it doesn't come, it doesn't start from the consumer. I think it comes from the companies providing a really good product and a really good product that's also sustainable. But fundamentally, people buy really good products. They don't buy really sustainable products. Um, there was a really good report many years ago um, written, and its conclusion was uh, people drive cars, they don't drive sustainability. Uh, and I guess Tesla and the Prius kind of challenged that a little bit, but still fundamentally people buy cars because it says something about them and it projects a certain image and it's in a price range and all those kind of things. So I um, I think for some, some consumers, some markets, some products, sometimes yes, consumer, um, but I, I think the main market has to be stimulated by companies and by governments. My view. And, and Graham, just to touch on that for a moment, because one of the things that our Meaningful Travel Summits try to make those connections around is, is the investment in these destinations and in these experiences to keep them sustainable and viable. So, you know, Greg and I often talk about it being a risk management issue for, for travel companies, that, that if these destinations thrive, your, your product will thrive. And so I think that kind of goes to that point of you, um, you building these experiences more sustainably for the destination is, is, is very much about risk management and viability of the tourism product. Yeah, and it, it produces a fantastic holiday, doesn't it? And, you know, a sustainable <laughs> holiday is a fantastic holiday, but people are interested in it, I think, majority because it's a fantastic holiday, not because it's a sustainable uh, holiday. There's only a few of us like on this call, get really excited about the, the minutiae of the sustainability of the holiday, I should think. Uh, what have we got here? Uh, regulation needs to come from this area. You know, our clients are attracted. Yeah. So uh, I think that's a really good point, Dominique, about the values of an organization. Uh, I, I think, uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll amend my previous comment about um, consumer driven, but I think uh, increasingly people are values driven. They, 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 you know, you, we, we get a sense of what an organization is and is it an organization that feels like my kind of organization? And then, of course, the challenge is to make sure that all of the products and everything you do in the organization matches up with your values. And you've not got that sort of cynical kind of statement of values that, that clearly you don't um, you don't actually deliver on. So, yeah, I think that point, uh, Dominique, is a really good one about the values of a company we, we look to. And then, Graham, I think we have um, time for one more question and I'll uh, close off with some housekeeping. But Robin had entered a question into the chat. Uh, I can't see that for a second. Sure. Um, I feel like I'd read it. Um, the UN has announced uh, uh, four-thirds catastrophe trends now within 10 years, the New York Times. How can we, with um, the biggest destinations as an industry, help with governments? Might Sorry, Norway that, help us the, with other key large countries? Just, just say the first part of that again, Katie. Sorry, I didn't get that. Um, I think the question is, how can we, with um, the biggest destinations as an industry, help with governments? And creating policy. Ah, okay. Um, it, it is really difficult, isn't it, for tourism? Tourism's not traditionally, you know, it's classically a Cinderella uh, industry that sort of sits in the corner and gets ignored. Uh, and it, it's, it's not something that has traditionally had great lobbying power. Uh, and of course, organizations uh, like some of those on the call, uh, it, it's, it's their job to lobby. Um, but I think in, uh, in the US, the same as in the U UK, the tourism industry is not a high profile industry. Uh, and, and so therefore it's, it's very difficult to, to be able to, to do that. I think uh, smaller countries 
Uh, so I'm going to offend. I hope that doesn't offend uh, you, Heger, in describing Norway as a smaller, smaller in, in population and not in terms of uh, 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 beauty and importance, but but population uh, wise, um, the uh, an economy wise, tourism's value and tourism's worth is more obvious to a country like Norway, I think, in the way that it is to if you're in the Caribbean or if you're in. Uh, other uh, smaller economies. Um, so I would imagine there that there's more um, kind of cut through uh, in terms of lobbying uh, government, but it is a uh, it is certainly a challenge for the tourism industry to get that that kind of recognition. I I, I fear that um, with some of those sort of things like we see in Amsterdam at the moment um, and the sort of almost creation of aviation as being a sin stock that that actually the sort of the reputation of of tourism or the aviation component of tourism at least rather than being sort of neutral is going over to being negative rather than being sort of not getting the positive recognition we feel we deserve we're we're now getting the negative criticism so i think that uh, sort of lobbying is maybe going against that, but Terry was saying. Yeah, yeah. Let me just jump in here. I think that is part of the function, certainly of USTOA and some of the other associations that are a part of the Tourism Cares family. Several times throughout the year, I will go to countries with the main purpose of educating regulators, legislative bodies on the impact both uh, from a social and economic perspective and how that touches sustainability. So I think you can look to the associations to help create a platform and a voice to um, educate. And yeah. it's not always, it's, it's an ongoing process, but um, that's certainly part of our role at USTOA. And before we go back to Katie, I'm gonna put Hege on the spot. So um, somebody reached out to me during the presentation and said, ask Hege, how do we pack? What do we wear? Blah, 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 blah. All right. I'm not sure if that's in your uh, housekeeping, Katie. So I can pass that to you. But I will all say layers and wool. Leave your cotton at home. It's all about wool, long underwears, wool close to your body, layers, mittens, not gloves, hats. Head, cover your head, fingers and feet, warm boots. But Katie has all the details and we'll send you a package. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Yes, just think warm and dress warm. But, um, and uh, thank you again, Graham. We really appreciate your time. And we're looking forward to spending more time with you in Norway. And we're looking forward to actually getting to see everyone in really just a few days. Um, so after this uh, call, we'll be sending an email with a link to the recording of this webinar to everyone in case they've missed it. Um, and in case you want to uh, loop back for any questions to see uh, Graham's presentation. And we'll also be including a short survey, which Graham mentioned as well. So please make sure you take the time to fill that out. And this coming Monday, um, April 10th, we'll be sending out an email to everyone that highlights um, similar to those questions, a lot of the details we have on the website, important contact information, some suggested readings from Graham to help you really prepare for the conversations we'll be having on site and a full and complete schedule and more. Um, and as you prepare for your trip, there is a suggested packing list um, on the website. Please make sure to read it through and um, dress warm as Hega said. And um, for our outdoor excursions, when you'll be spending a lot of time in the outdoors, there will be provided jumpsuits and extra warm clothing, but you will need stuff to walk back and forth. So um, there will be some things provided on site. Um, and it's also important, as always, pack your reusable water bottle, important travel documents, and another important detail is a valid driver, driver's license if you have one. Um, and we'll post um, a link to our website with all these details in the chat below. And then um, we have just a, some time for a few more questions if there's anything specific you'd like us to, uh, to address. Um, but other than that, you can reach out to myself or Christina, who's also been emailing you, and we're happy to answer, answer individual questions. And it looks like that's it at the moment. Awesome. 
Well, thank you guys again. Um, we'll be you. following up again. Any questions, please reach out. And um, we look forward to seeing you all very soon. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Bye. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you, Paula. Bye-bye.